today we are looking at a case from the early 20th century, so please sit back as we go to the USA. Blanca Elena Rasuris Vergara was born on the 9th of April 1894 in Viña del Mar, a seaside city in the Valparaiso region of Chile. She was the eldest daughter of Guillermo Erariso Mineta and Blanca Vergara Alvarez. Her father was very wealthy and owned copper mines in the country. Her mother was a sister of a former Chilean president. Blanca's father sadly died when she was just two years old, leaving her mother a very wealthy widow. When Blanca was considered old enough, she was sent to be educated in England and was enrolled in a Catholic convent in London called the Sacred Heart. While she was in London, Chile was undergoing a period of political stability and economic growth. The country had experienced a series of political and social changes in the preceding decades, including the War of the Pacific between 1879 and 1884, which resulted in territorial gains for the country at the expense of Peru and Bolivia. By 1911, Chile was under the presidency of Don Ramon Barros Luco. His administration focused on economic development and modernization, encouraging foreign investments and industrialization. One of the people who came to Chile during this time was an American named John de Soule. He traveled to the country as a representative for the South American Concession Syndicate. This was an organization that actively engaged in advocating for the development of the Trans-Andean Railroad. In the year 1911, while he was working in Chile, he met Blanca, who had recently returned to the country following the completion of her studies. She was instantly attracted to him, even though he was 15 years her senior, having been born on the 25th of May 1878. John was from Bethlehem in Pennsylvania, a thriving industrial city known for its steel production. Since he was young, he had always excelled as American football. In 1901, he achieved the pinnacle of his athletic career by not only serving as a star quarterback, but also donning the captain's mantle for the Yale University varsity football team. His stellar performances and leadership skills earned him a coveted spot in the prestigious 1901 college football All-American team, a recognition bestowed on him by the New York Post. A year later, in 1902, he was appointed as head football coach at the University of Virginia. Despite Blanca still being a teenager, John proposed to her and she eagerly accepted. However, this decision did not sit well with her family. They believed that Blanca was too young for marriage and they were uneasy about the significant age difference between her and John. Furthermore, the family was aware that John had been engaged twice before, first to the heiress, Miss Mary Elise Moore, and then to Miss Elena Granville Brown. There was a lingering suspicion that his interest in Blanca might have just been motivated by her family's wealth. Despite these concerns, John and Blanca went ahead with their marriage. The ceremony took place on the 14th of December 1911 at an English Catholic chapel in Paris in France. Following a brief period in Europe, they returned to America and settled in New York. At first, everything was good for them. Blanca embraced the city's opulent charm and liked to walk up and down Fifth Avenue, exploring the high-end boutiques that lined the bustling streets. But she soon became pregnant, and on Christmas Day 1912, the couple joyfully celebrated the arrival of their son, who they named John after his father, and who was affectionately known as John Jr. or Jack. They chose the influential steel magnate, Charles H. Schwab, to be the child's godfather. The joy of parenthood, however, did not shield their marriage from the strains that would later plague it. As time passed, the once harmonious relationship began to crack under the weight of Blanca's husband's well-known infidelities. The whispers of his extramarital affairs became an undeniable reality, casting shadows over the happiness that once defined their marriage. In the summer of 1916, the breaking point arrived. Blanca, now confronted with the harsh reality of her husband's indiscretions, made the painful decision to file for divorce. The city that had so many fond memories, where they had chosen to make their home and where their son had been born, now became the backdrop 
for the disillusion of their once promising marriage, leaving behind a tale of shattered dreams and the echoes of a love that had succumbed to the challenges of reality. Just before initiating divorce proceedings, Blanca struck up an intriguing relationship with Rudolf Valentino, who at the time was best known for his captivating Argentine tango performances, a dance that was particularly popular. While the nature of Blanca and Rudolf's connection remains a mystery, what is clear is that he played a pivotal role in the unfolding drama. He took the stand in the December 1916 divorce hearing and supported Blanca's claims of her husband's infidelities, declaring that his own dance partner, the renowned Joan Sawyer, was one of the women with who John de Saul was having a relationship. When news of this was told in the court, the interest from the press greatly increased. Other witnesses confirmed that Mr. de Saul and Miss Sawyer had been known to keep each other's company on many occasions. It was reported that Blanca's mother, Blanca Vergara Alvarez, was one of the wealthiest women in Chile. This revelation added another layer to the proceedings as Mr. de Saul found himself grappling with accusations of financial misconduct, especially regarding the mishandling of his wife's considerable fortune. The couple eventually obtained joint custody of their son, but John emerged from the proceedings with a tarnished reputation and the loss of any future benefits from his wife's family's money. In the aftermath, John, now consumed by bitterness, pointed an accusatory finger at Rudolf Valentino for the entire ordeal. Utilising his political sway, he orchestrated his arrest, along with a certain madam named Mrs Thine, on some unspecified vice charges. However, the evidence against them was feeble at best, so after spending a few disheartening days behind bars, Rudolf's bail miraculously dropped from an exorbitant $10,000 to a more manageable $1,500. However, the ensuing scandal became a media spectacle, casting a harsh light on him, and his work offers became limited, as even his once steadfast friends turned their backs on him. In a cruel twist, Blanca, the very person he sought to help with his testimony, offered no gratitude and severed all ties with him. As stipulated in the divorce settlement, John and Blanca were prohibited from taking their son out of the country during the ongoing First World War in Europe. Despite this, Blanca pleaded with the court for an exception, seeking permission to take her son to Chile to visit his grandmother. The submission of this application faced vehement opposition from John de Saul, who adamantly asserted that sea travel posed significant risks during that period. Blanca, on the other hand, staunchly maintained that her return to Chile was imperative for health reasons and emphasised that she would not undertake the journey without her son. This clash of perspectives between the divorced couple served only to intensify the hostile nature of their relationship. On the 3rd of August 1917, Blanca left her residence in Rosalyn, New York to go and collect her child from her former husband at his house in Meadowbrook Colony near Westbury and was accompanied by her maid. The legal intricacies of their separation included shared custody of their son. Upon arrival at his house, Blanca walked up to the porch and knocked on the door. Inside was her ex-husband's father, Mr. Arthur de Saul, his sister, Mrs. R. Denga, and a friend named Mr. Marshall Ward. However, instead of collecting her son, what actually transpired was a heated exchange, an emotional argument, fueled by unresolved tensions and conflicting interpretations of their custody agreement. John refused to hand over the child. Blanca, now seemingly driven to breaking point, retrieved a gun from her dress and with unwavering determination, pointed it at him. She demanded the immediate relinquishment of the child and said, there is only one more thing left to do. In a grim and fateful moment, the night took a deadly turn as Blanca discharged the gun five times. John fell against the door, then onto the floor. With the noise of the gunshots, the three people inside the house rushed to him and it was apparent that he needed urgent medical attention. Mr. Ward dialed for an ambulance and then the Nassau County Sheriff. John was urgently transported to the county hospital where Dr. Henry Werner assessed the severity of his wounds. As a doctor prepared for a critical operation, John summoned his strength 
and in a weak voice uttered the words, My wife shot me. I want you to have her arrested. My wife shot me. Despite the valiant efforts of the medical team, John de Saul tragically succumbed to his injuries at precisely 10.20 p.m. Amidst the aftermath of the shooting, Blanca chose not to evade the consequences of her actions. Instead, she remained at the scene, awaiting the inevitable arrival of law enforcement. With a sense of sombre acceptance, she surrendered herself to the police officers. All she could say was, I shot him because he wouldn't let me have my boy. I'm glad I did it. There was nothing else for me to do. The legal aftermath unfolded swiftly as she was formally charged with the grave offence of first degree murder. Consequently, she found herself confined within the walls of the Nassau County Jail in Mineola in New York. The media, true to its sensational style, swiftly broadcasted the story, captivating the attention of the American public. The tale unfolded as a gripping saga, a Chilean beauty, heiress to the fortune of the wealthiest woman in her country, had fatally shot her ex-husband, none other than the distinguished former captain of the Yale University varsity football team. The combination of wealth, beauty and a high-profile connection made the story a gripping spectacle. The trial eventually began on the 12th of November 1917. Blanca was defended by Henry Uterart, a very shrewd and capable attorney who had a reputation for winning cases. But many believed this to be an open and shut case. The defendant had shot her husband five times in front of her son, her maid and other witnesses. The prosecution outlined the events leading up to the fateful night of the 3rd of August and told the court that Mrs. de Saul had kept her son for two more days than she was allowed following the divorce agreement. So her ex-husband had therefore informed her that he would be keeping the boy for an extra two days as his father and sister would be visiting. One of the key prosecution witnesses was Mrs. Denger, the deceased man's sister. She stood in the witness box and told the court that on the night that this terrible event happened, she was coming down the stairs into the main hallway where she greeted her ex-sister-in-law pleasantly but did not get a response. All Mrs. de Saul said was, I want to see Jack. Where is he? Mrs. Denger went on to say that her brother had entered the hallway and asked Mrs. de Saul what she had wanted, to which she replied, I have come for Jack. You can't have him. I want my boy. In response, Mr. de Saul, apparently speaking in a soft voice, stated, We can't discuss that, Blanca. I cannot discuss that with you. When asked what happened next, Mrs. Denger said that her brother turned away from the door and she witnessed Mrs. de Saul retrieving something from her dress. In an instant, a flash illuminated the scene and her brother fell to the floor. All the while, his four-year-old son looked on in astonishment. Mrs. Denger added that the gun was discharged multiple times before Mrs. de Saul calmly exited into the night. Interestingly, no one made an attempt to intervene, but Mrs. de Saul then paused, looked back and casually remarked, I suppose you better call for an officer. Mrs. Denger said that they immediately called Manola Hospital for an ambulance and then called the police. During court proceedings, Dr. Werner provided testimony, revealing that subsequent to Mr. Saul's demise, he conducted an autopsy. He said that the examination uncovered three bullet wounds in the left arm of the deceased. The fatal shot, however, was the initial one that was fired into Mr. de Saul's back, penetrating the abdomen and ultimately leading to his tragic death. But defence took a very different narrative, aiming to draw on the extensive media coverage due to the involvement of high-profile individuals and the sensational nature of the case. They not only focused on the events of the shooting, but also explored the broader societal issues surrounding divorce, custody disputes, and the emotional toll on individuals involved. Mrs. Blanca de Saul took the stand in her own defence. She told of her childhood in Chile, the death of her father, her education in England, and how she had met her husband. She said they were happy, but when they came to live in New York, her husband's attitude towards her changed. She told how she had inherited securities worth $100,000 from her late father, which she gave to her husband 
However, he was not very pleased. And instead, he just said, Why, that's nothing. It's absurd to call you an heiress. She recounted a visit made alone to England, during which her husband had requested that she leave signed blank cheques in case he required funds in her absence. Upon her return, she discovered that he had cashed $6,000 without her knowledge. Mrs. DeSaul also revealed that for her own protection, she had purchased a revolver, the very weapon used in the fatal incident. During the trial, her attorney presented a card with an image of a woman, accompanied by affectionate words addressed to Mr. John DeSaul. The defence used this to further illuminate Mr. DeSaul's history of infidelity and adulterous behaviour. They continued to highlight these points by reading aloud a series of letters penned by Mrs. DeSaul, revealing a desperate plea for her husband to give her and her son more attention. The defence aimed to provide context to the events leading up to the tragic incident and shed light on the emotional upheaval within their fractured relationship. They claimed that medical evidence would prove that Mrs. DeSaul was prone to lapses of responsibility due to the suffering from pronounced hypothyroidism, a condition that they claimed had affected her mental awareness and that had probably been caused following a serious fall when she was just a young girl in Chile. They said that when she shot her ex-husband, she was not mentally sound and did not know the nature of the act or that it was wrong to do it. The defence then called upon expert medical witnesses. Dr Sherman White was one such medical expert who testified. He told the court that he examined the defendant three days after the shooting. He said that he noticed a peculiar pallor in Mrs DeSaul, observing that she appeared disorientated and had limited awareness of her surroundings. Despite his questions, her responses were vague and confused. He added that there were physical indicators, such as a swollen tongue, dry skin and cracked brittle nails, which hinted at a distressed state. Her pulse and blood pressure were below normal and her heart rate was feeble. During the examination, Dr White said that Mrs DeSaul did manage to ask him if her husband could take away her child, but when he told her that her husband was dead, she did not seem to understand his reply and looked blankly into space. He added that during his physical examination of her, he pressed his finger slightly to the left of her skull line and just within the hairline. This caused her some discomfort. She shrieked and then turned away. Dr White further introduced an x-ray of the defendant's skull, revealing an untreated fracture. He went on to say that further examination led him to conclude that she suffered from deficiency of the thyroid glandular substance, without which vital processes in the body become impaired. Treatment for this condition, however, had subsequently resulted in an improvement in Mrs. DeSaul's health. Dr. Jelf, another medical professional who examined Mrs. DeSaul, concurred with the diagnosis. He pronounced that she was suffering from pronounced hypothyroidism. The medical testimony provided the court with a comprehensive understanding of Mrs. DeSaul's physical and mental states at the time of the incident and offered insights into the factors contributing to her actions. Miss Amelia Erasuris Vergara, the defendant's sister, also testified. She confirmed that Blanca had fallen as a child and had struck her head against a fireplace, from which she sustained severe injuries. However, the prosecution also produced their own expert medical witnesses. Dr Charles Pilgrim, who was chairman of the New York State Hospital Commission, and Dr Isham Harris, an expert in mental illness, both declared that they believed the defendant to have been of sound mind when she shot her ex-husband and was totally aware that it was wrong to do it. Suzanne Montieu, Mrs de Saul's maid, was an important witness and when she came to the stand there was a sudden silence. Her testimony, however, was frequently interrupted as her excited manner and French accent sometimes made it difficult for her to be understood. She recounted the night of the tragic event and revealed that she had accompanied Mrs. de Saul to her ex-husband's property. According to Miss Montieu, Mrs. de Saul entered the living room and informed Mr. de Saul of her intention to take her son. In response, Mr. de Saul adamantly declared that she could not have him, neither now or ever. Mrs. Montieu added that at the time, she had been standing next to Mrs. de Saul and saw her turn awfully pale. 
now overcome with emotion, the witness began to sob and then said that in that moment, Mrs. de Saul shot her ex-husband. On cross-examination, Miss Montieu was asked if Mrs. de Saul had said following the shooting, I'm glad I did it, to which Miss Montieu replied that she did not. The trial ended on the 1st of December, after the two counsels summed up the case. It was apparent that spectators in the courtroom and some jurors were moved by the defence counsel's summing up. Mr. Uterart said of his client, her warm loving heart was in contrast to the cold calculating and selfish nature of her ex-husband, which caused Mrs. de Saul to believe that she was always to blame when anything went wrong. Her boy was the only thing she saved after the wreck of her married life. Her money was nearly all gone. Her husband was gone. Her love was gone. Then she found that his father was trying to take her boy away from her. The jury deliberated for less than two hours before returning at 9.25pm to announce that they found the defendant, Mrs. Blanca de Saul, not guilty. When Mrs. de Saul heard the verdict, she smiled and sat down in her chair. The press continued to report the story, but it took another twist when on Christmas Eve, Less than four weeks since the trial had ended, the father of John de Saul, Major Arthur Bryce de Saul, was found dead in his home. It was believed that he had died from grief at the loss of his son and the ordeal of the trial. He was 78 years old. Blanca decided to make a fresh start in San Francisco, where she actively pursued and successfully obtained full custody of her son. Later they went to live in Japan, before eventually returning to Chile. On the 22nd of December 1921, she married again in Santiago in Chile, this time to an engineer named Fernando Santa Cruz Wilson. However, this union eventually faced its challenges, leading to their divorce a few years later. In the late 1930s, Blanca's health began to deteriorate and she found herself estranged from her son. Their relationship strained. He chose to sever contact with his mother opting to return to the United States. The following years brought forth personal hardships for Blanca and on the 20th of March 1940, struggling with health issues, she tragically took her own life. She succumbed to an overdose of barbiturates at her luxurious residence in Viña del Mar. Her life that had been marked by legal battles, international travels and personal struggles reached a somber conclusion, leaving behind a legacy tinged with both triumphs and tragedies. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. As usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I hope to see you all again in the next brief case.